Thank you again for joining this webinar today. This webinar is sponsored by the Institute on Disability and Human Development and the Leadership Education and Neurodevelopmental Disabilities or LEND program, both at UIC's Department of Disability and Human Development, as well as the Autism Program of Illinois. Funding is provided in part by the Autism Program of Illinois and the Illinois Department of Human Services. We are excited to have great presenters with us today to share about this important topic. And now it is my great pleasure to turn over the presentation over to our presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jajen. Hi everyone, this is Jesse speaking. Um, welcome to our webinar today uh, entitled Recognizing the Signs of Exploitation Among Individuals with Disabilities. Uh, we will do a brief introduction of ourselves in just a moment, but Jody Haskin will be presenting as well as myself, Jessica Hinman, and uh, Timothy S. T.J. Gordon. Um, also, some of this content was developed in part with the help of Susan Kahan, who is unable to be with us today, but will be here for our following two webinars as well. Um, today, we are going to be talking a lot about exploitation in the realm of human trafficking and the intersection between human trafficking and individuals with developmental disabilities. Obviously, exploitation is a very broad topic, and for today and subsequent webinars, we will be focusing on human trafficking specifically. Um, so we are excited to be here and to present this contact content to you all over the next three weeks. So we'll go ahead and dive in. So we will now all go ahead and introduce ourselves if Jody wants to start off. Great, thank you, Jesse. This is Jody Haskin. Um, I am the interim executive director at the International Organization for Adolescents. Um, we are located in Chicago, but we've been around for about 20 years to provide training and technical assistance and capacity building for organizations who work with young people. And we focus specifically on, um, at least in the last several years, on human trafficking and um, really have been um, at the at the crux of providing these kinds of trainings since we um, since we started in 1999. I've been with the organization for the last eight years and I am happy to be here with all of you today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jesse Hinman. I am currently the research coordinator at the CBM clinic at UIC's family clinic. I'm currently a doctoral candidate within the rehabilitation science program at UIC. Uh, last year, I became involved with the National Human Trafficking and Disability Working Group through my fellowship with LEND, um, and I have continued my work with them since uh, finishing that fellowship. So I'm still here and trying to be as involved as possible along the way. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Timotheus Gordon Jr., also known as TJ Gordon. And my pronoun is he, his, him. I am currently a research associate at the Institute on Disability and Human Development here at UIC. And I am also one of the co-founders of Chicago and Disabled People of Color Coalition, which is a group of disabled people of color in the Chicagoland area that promotes inclusion, acceptance, and disability pride in communities of color throughout the Chicagoland area. And we are also part of the, we are also uh, affiliated with Illinois Self-Advocacy Alliance. Great, thank you, TJ. This is Jody. Um, I did want to mention something about the National Human Trafficking and Disabilities Working Group. Um, IOPA is one of the founders of this working group, and we do a lot of work directly at this intersection of working within the disability community and the anti-trafficking community to help to identify barriers and services and address them. Also to look at training opportunities and research opportunities at this intersection as well. Um, if you want to be more involved or learn more about it, um, the information is here. You can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, also, some of the organizations um, that have come together on a national level have really started to come together on a local level here in Chicago as well. Um, we do have a grant sponsored by the um, for help for children um, to look at this intersection of human trafficking as it impacts young people with disabilities. Next slide, please. This is Jesse. So, during this webinar, we're really going to be centering on survivors of human trafficking, specifically those with uh, disabilities. So, during this time, please be mindful of the space that we're creating here. Um, please be mindful of the chat box and any questions that you might have. If you do have any comments or questions that you're unsure about asking, feel free to send them to one of the hosts privately and we'd be happy to answer them. Um, please also be respectful of the space. Um, and understand that this webinar is being recorded. So again, if you would like to ask a specific question or make a comment, um, you are more than welcome to do so privately and can contact us either during the webinar or afterwards, we will provide you with contact information at the end. Um, of course, this content is very heavy. So please be sure to practice self care throughout the webinar and after the webinar as well. If you do find that, you know, some of the content is making you uncomfortable, please feel free to step away. It is a hard topic. Um, we obviously respect you and your decision to do that, and you know yourself best to make that decision. Um, so kind of just be mindful of, of yourself and what comes up as, as we cover this content and uh, as well as others. So, as we had previously mentioned, this is a webinar series. There will be 3 different webinars over the next few weeks. Uh, this is webinar 1 where we will focus on human trafficking exploitation, but more specifically why disability providers should know about human trafficking. It'll sort of serve as an introduction to human trafficking kind of answer that question of what is human trafficking? What does it look like? Uh, we will also discuss in depth about the intersection of human trafficking and disability, as well as some of the indicators or red flags of human trafficking that you might um, notice at some point. Webinar two, we will be talking more specifically about supporting human trafficking sub survivors with disabilities. And then webinar three, we'll wrap up our series by talking about trauma-informed practices for individuals with disabilities who have experienced human trafficking. So we're really kind of starting with webinar one as an introduction and then getting more in depth over the subsequent weeks. So just to kind of set the stage for this current webinar, you might be wondering to yourself, why do disability providers need to know about exploitation and human trafficking? Um, you know, what's the connection? So as providers who are serving individuals with disabilities and or their families, you are in a unique position to help prevent, identify, and address potential human trafficking situations. Our goal for this webinar is to help you um, gain some tools and some skills to understand how youth and individuals with disabilities are trafficked so that you can recognize potential trafficking situations with young people that you work with. And addressing human trafficking among individuals with disabilities within your programs, your clinics, your schools is consistent with supporting and empowering the individuals that you work with to live healthy and positive life lives. So let's go ahead and get started by talking about some misconceptions about human trafficking. I'll hand it over to TJ. This is TJ speaking. So when you hear of human trafficking, we may usually think of young women or girls or um, young people who are uh, women presenting. We also usually think of those from a different country or speak little to no English. We may, when we hear of human tra trafficking, we may uh, think of those who been kidnapped, such as um, being snap snatched from a parking lot, or whoever's kidnapped are usually so into a form of slavery, whether it is sex trade or massage parlors. Usually 
when human trafficking is portrayed in the media, the woman is usually physical restrained or held against their will. You may also see images or trailers of people who are moved across the southern border or may move across um, outside of their home uh, country. Next slide, please. So our first poll question for today is this. Human trafficking does not directly impact people with disabilities, please reply to the following statement as true or false. So you may, do we type it in true or false in the chat or is there a poll that will appear? Just for clarification. This is Jesse. Participants are welcome to type their answer in the chat or think about it to themselves, whatever everyone's most comfortable with. So this is TJ speaking, and after you all think about it or type it in for a couple of minutes, we will uh, reveal the um, answer. All right, so the answer to this question is false. People with disabilities are trafficked in all parts of the United States, rural areas, reservations, suburbs, and even urban areas. Therefore, human trafficking does affect people with disabilities. By the way, we appreciate you all thinking about the question or responding to the question through chat. We appreciate it. Next slide. So the next section I will talk about is the national data on the abuse of victims with disabilities. Individuals with multiple disabilities are more often victims of crime than those with only one disability or no disability at all. Therefore, if you have a multiple disability, two or more disabilities, you may be a victim of the crime more likely than if you only have one or no known disability at all. Individuals with disabilities are two and a half times as likely to be victims of crime than those who are non disabled. Can you go back one slide, please? Yes. And then 40% of victims who have disabilities usually know their offender. So, in instances of the crime, they know their. Um, the redder it's a caregiver or even a family member. Next slide, please. In addition, we have more um, as well, more data. So um, about 13% or 12.7% of crimes against people with disabilities are serious violent crimes either rape, sexual assault, robbery, and aggravated assault. 20% of individuals with disabilities who are victimized do not report the crime because they feel authorities would not believe them. And individuals with cognitive disabilities are more likely to be victims of crime, but report these crimes less than other individuals with disabilities. Next slide, please. 
We'll now head it over head it over to Jody and she will talk more about um case studies and examples of um those crimes and how it's reported. Great, thank you, TJ. This is Jody. I do want to talk about some case studies, um, mainly because it's um, a really good example of how this is happening today. And we also know that some of the human trafficking laws were created because of cases that impacted um, people who were who were trafficked who had disabilities. Um, so these cases were um, the cases that I'm going to talk to you now about are more recent, um, but the cases that have in involved people with disabilities that we have even known about um, that informed these laws have gone back to um, the 1990s and before that. Um, so that's something to keep in mind that this has really been taking place. There's a really a root in, um, an, in trafficking as um, with survivors with disabilities. Uh, the first case example that I want to talk about um, is where three traffickers targeted young men at um, a program for youth with developmental disabilities and substance misuse rehabilitation programs. Um, in this case, the traffickers befriended the youth and they learned that they felt lonely, disconnected, and were struggling with and addicted and um, to drugs and were struggling with misuse of drugs. So when the traffickers discovered this, they began to offer a sense of belonging by communicating often and being friendly toward the youth. Um, they also supplied the young men with drugs and the youth were reminded that if they talked to anyone else about what was going on, they would be found out and that they were doing drugs illegally and they could get kicked out of their program where they were also being housed and that they would also get trouble, be in trouble with the police too. Um, so when the youth built up enough debt to the trafficker because of the drugs that the trafficker was provided to them, um, the trafficker then would would force them into performing commercial sex acts to strangers, and then the traffickers kept the money. Soon the traffickers began to withhold the drugs that they were providing to the youth. So while the youth were experienced withdrawal, the traffickers would then um, make them perform commercial sex acts so they could get drugs back. They continued this cycle, including using their addictions um, to continue the commercial sexual exploitation. Um, and as you'll see, you'll be able to pick out some issues of power and control. And for those of you who are very familiar with um, domestic violence as well, um, there are very similar attributes to human trafficking and exploitation um, as there is with um, with domestic and gender based violence. Um, so looking at um, power and control issues, ways that they are looking to befriend them, um, looking for ways that they are um, things that they need. They wanted friendship, so they provided friendship. Um, they were struggling with drug misuse, so they gave them drugs and they used that as a way and a means to provide power and control over them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this case is a case of familial trafficking. So this means that um, the mother was trafficking her daughter. Um, she was charged with sex trafficking because she was forcing her 14 year old daughter um, who lives with mental and physical di disabilities to provide sex acts to men in exchange for cocaine for herself. Um, this is um, something that not everybody understands as a form of human trafficking. Um, often people believe that human trafficking only happens when there's a form of movement, um, but in this case, trafficking was happening within the home. Um, young people who depend on a parental caregiver may also be isolated from others a little more easily if they already live with a trafficker. Um, and this, this person who was her caregiver, her mother, was also meant to be the person who was her form of communication for others. So she was not only isolated geographically and physically, but also through communication as well. Next slide, please. Um, and in this case, um, the, this is a couple um, called Arlen and Linda Kaufman. They ran a residential care treatment center for people with disabilities and mental health struggles for more than 20 years. Uh, the Kaufmans stole the social security benefits of their patients, and then they charged Medicare for the services. 
Um, so as part of the treatment or quote unquote treatment, uh, the Kaufman's forced patients to perform nude manual labor and then recorded videos of sex acts. Um, way back in the 80s, uh, the Department of Social and Rehabilitation Services began to receive reports that the Kaufmans were abusing their patients. Um, and even in 1999, the police received a report of um, nude adults working in a field. Um, and it wasn't until 2004 when someone tried to leave and allege abuse that there was an investigation by the state attorney's, attorney general office. Um, and that led to a court order that suspended their guardianship. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this case might be more familiar to more people just because it was made into a, a book or a larger article in 2016. And um, this is um, a case where there were 32 men with intellectual disabilities who were taken from Texas and brought to Iowa. Um, and they were forced to work in a turkey evisceration plant um, for over 30 years. So this is generations of people. Um, they were paid only 41 cents an hour and they lived in squalor. So there were rats and cockroaches, there were open bathrooms. Um, they were physically and verbally abused by their supervisors. And as punishment, one victim was forced to hold heavy blocks for extended periods of time. Um, they weren't allowed bathroom breaks. They were beaten. Um, so um, one of the biggest issues with this is that this evisceration plant was in a small community. In this community, people knew each other. It was a very friendly community. People knew about um, what they called the boys in the bunkhouse. Um, where the article title came from. However, people didn't understand that what was happening to them was abuse, exploitation, and human trafficking. Um, and had somebody been aware of some of the signs, been aware that there was something that they could do about it, perhaps 30 years wouldn't have gone by without, um, without them being, being able to get some kind of help. Um, so that's really why we wanted to talk to you all today so you can have an idea of what human trafficking is so you can recognize it and the young people that you serve and that you can have some idea about some next steps, steps to take. Um, next slide, please. So to learn what human trafficking is, um, it's good to have a definition of what it is so we understand what it isn't and what it actually is and how it takes place. So in these case studies, you may not have recognized that it would be human trafficking. You may have recognized that it was more of a case of exploitation or um, mistreatment at the very least um, or abuse, but maybe not recognize that it was human trafficking. Um, so generally speaking, human trafficking is an exploitation of an individual by a trafficker for the purposes of gaining either labor or sex acts at the expense of the young person. So this is a crime at both federal and state levels. Um, and before I move on, I'd like to take a moment to note on the language that we use in this presentation. So human trafficking, as I mentioned, is a crime um, and the youth and the children, the adults who are trafficked are victims of a crime. Um, but we also understand that when somebody leaves a trafficking situation, um, they are not always understand, first of all, while they're in a trafficking situation, not understand that they are a victim of a crime. Um, and second of all, not everybody wants to be labeled as a victim. So um, we often use the term survivor or a person with lived experience um, after consulting with people who have left a trafficking situation. Um, and for the purposes of this presentation, we will use the term survivor. And when we're talking specifically about being a victim of a crime, that's when we'll use the term victim as a legal term. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, def the definition of human trafficking is the practice of exploiting people as commodities in conditions of sexual and or labor serv servitude. So each state in the US also has its own state level trafficking law, um, but most states tend to take their laws from the federal law, which is called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act um, or the TVPA. And this generally, the TVPA generally has more protections for young people than many state laws do. Um, so for these reasons, we'll use the federal definition um, for the purposes of this presentation. 
So trafficking can take the form of sex trafficking or labor trafficking or a combination of both of these. Um, so in adults, force, fraud, or coercion is used to exploit a person to perform sex acts and to provide labor for the benefit of the trafficker. Um, but in individuals under the age of 18, there is no need to show force, fraud, or coercion. It's just really um, somebody who's exchanging something of value for a sex act. Um, we see this a lot when there are runaway homeless youth who are just trying to find a way to stay alive, to find a place to stay. Um, there's These are cases where we find that there is human trafficking without a trafficker. It's still considered human trafficking because there is um, something of value that's being traded for a sex act. For example, a place to stay, um, even drugs, money, um, or food. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to give you some kind of idea, we always are asked how many people are trafficked in the US, um, but this is a dark crime. If we knew how many people were being trafficked, we'd be out there providing services to all of them. Um, but because this is a, a dark crime, there's dark data, meaning that we don't have all of the answers. Um, but one thing we do have is information about how many reports have come in into a specific hotline that's focused only on human trafficking. So to keep this in mind, um, there are plenty of people who are receiving services or have, um, or who are um, looking to leave a trafficking situation that we know about, um, but have not been included in the statistics that you see in front of you. This is only for people who have called or texted or um, created a report to this National Human Trafficking Hotline. But it does give you an idea so that you know that it's actually happening. Um, so here we have. Um, in Illinois, 1100 or 11,500 cases, um, and then Illinois, 267, and this was from 2019. Um, across the United States, there have been 63,380 human trafficking cases reported um, since December of 2007. And again, this is only in cases where people are aware of the phone number and they're actually calling in to make a report. So it's just a, what we understand is a very small slice of, of our knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. To understand more exactly what human trafficking looks like, here are the elements of what makes up human trafficking. There needs to be these three main things to, to be considered a human trafficking uh, case. So there first must be one form of action. So in the red box on the left, you see recruit, harbor, entice, transport, provide, obtain, maintain, advertise, solicit, and patronize. It only has to be one of those um, in, um, in connection with one of the forms of means, which is force, fraud, or, or coercion. Um, I think we all know what force looks like. We've seen that in the cases where people may be um, beaten if, they're, if they try to leave or refuse to work, for example. Um, fraud, we saw that in the case of the young men who were trafficked by the three traffickers, um, they were provided with a fraudulent friendship. They were betrayed by these men they thought were their friends. Um, and then also coercion, and this includes things like threats um, and even um, as in the, the same case where they were provided with drugs and then taken or the drugs were taken away as, as well. Um, and again, to be clear, that for somebody who's under the age of 18, force, fraud, and coercion, it's not required as a form um, to, be, to be present in a form of sex trafficking if the person's under the age of 18. Um, but these things are, one of these things are um, necessary in a case of labor trafficking. Uh, next slide, please. We know that ta uh, traffickers target can target anybody um, from any age, any gender identification, um, any background at all. We know that traffickers will target them. They will groom them. They will get to know them and then determine where their needs are. And then that's when they'll provide needs, needs for them um, so that they create a sense of trust and dependence. Specifically, um, what you see here are uh, communities of young people who are at 
extra risk um, because of additional needs that they may have. Um, so as we talked about previously, runaway and homeless youth have a lot of needs that are basic, including a place to stay, food, um, and anything that's going to help them to just live. Um, young people with disabilities, survivors of abuse who may be trying to leave um, an abusive relationship, um, LGBTQIA plus individuals, um, people who are um, experience debt, um, people who are looking for education or jobs or better opportunities for their lives in general, um, undocumented foreign nationals and displaced people from, from other places where there is civil unrest, um, natural disasters and political instability, which will be a push factor in human trafficking. But next slide, please. All right, this is TJ speaking, and I'll spend a few moments talking about why do traffickers target people with uh, ID or DD or autism. Next slide, please. Why are youth with disabilities at higher risk of trafficking? They may be at higher risk because either the youth with a disability is looking for money to support themselves and their family, or the family is looking for uh, money as well. Or maybe they, maybe the traffickers may see youth with disabilities as money make opportunities as well. People, some people still view people with disabilities as um, burdens to families, to the community. They, people with disabilities may also be trafficked due to lack of resources on not only the uh, survivors or people who are impacted point of view, but also the um, perpetrators themselves. There's also lack of options for both families and persons with disabilities. In some instances, people with disabilities are sometimes groomed at early ages, so they may be groomed to be trafficked at an early age, and then they could be they may be trafficked. They may enter human trafficking later as a mature or grow uh, older. People, unfortunately, tend to look the other way when it comes to abuse of people with disabilities. And it, it could be tied to the fact that we are seen as burdens or also as we also are viewed as people without a voice. Next slide, please. Children with disabilities are at least three times more likely to be abused or neglected than peers without disability. Children, um, many of the same factors that put young people at risk for sexual exploitation also puts them at risk for trafficking. There are a growing number of exploited and trafficked children with disabilities in the United States. However, there are very few programs who uh, that emphasize the unique experiences and need of this community. Next slide, please. Oh, so as far as the um, where people could recruit the people with disabilities to um, be a part of the human trafficking trade. Here are examples of recruitment sites. They could be recruited in group homes, mental health facilities, social security and benefits office. They may be um, recruited 
online, especially on social media sites or chat rooms. They may be um, recruited at substance abuse disorder programs or homeless shelters or youth programs. They may be even um, trafficked in their own home. And all the connections with those sites are basically um, sites where people are at their most comfort or vulnerability, depending on the situation. Next slide, please. I will now hand it over to Jody, where she will talk more about ways traffickers could control people with disabilities. Great, thank you, TJ. Um, we know that um, there is a large element of power and control when it comes to traffickers and how they um, they make sure that they're grooming, recruiting, and um, maintaining control over the people that they're trafficking. Um, some of these strategies that the traffickers do are are designed to make the young people feel like no one will believe them if they tell them about what's happening. They make them believe that it's their choice. Um, they make them believe that um, everybody's in on it or it's very normal. They very much normalize the situation. Um, they make them think that, um, that they don't need help or additional care um, because they and their situa situation is completely fine. Um, also, that they will um, they will offer to provide better care or support. Um, so maybe if somebody is in a group home and they are not happy there, or maybe they're um, living in a place where they don't feel like they're safe or they're happy, the trafficker will provide that kind of false sense of security and may invite them to live with them, um, but they might have to do it in exchange for something else. Um, they might offer them a sense of family for some people who don't feel like they have um, that kind of connection with family members. Um, the traffickers will be anybody that the young person needs in their life. Um, so again, after they really um, get to know the young person and find out where they're where their vulnerabilities lie. Um, they can pretend to be a mother figure or a father figure, a romantic figure, um, or even just a very good friend. We know that a lot of young people are just looking for some kind of connection, somebody who understands, um, somebody who will be there for them. And um, to create that kind of bond and connection is something a lot of young people are looking for. Um, so they'll offer them this kind of protective bubble um, and then they'll turn around and say, well, now you need to do this for me if you love me, if you are my friend, um, or they'll say you owe me this. So there are a lot of different ways that a trafficker might go about this. Um, they might actually even as, as we learned before that they could even pose as a group home and pose as um, an official organization that's providing them with care, um, but often they will make sure that they're getting to know the person um, and then will isolate them um, from those who can identify their situation as ex exploitative or abusive um, or even trafficking. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, TJ has got a poll question for everybody. This is Jody, but I'm happy to, to um, ask everybody as well. Um, so this is a true or false question and please reply in the chat um, to the following statement is true or false. Uh, people with disabilities often don't know their trafficker. True or false, people with disabilities often do not know their trafficker. True or false, you can put that in the chat. In the chat.
And the answer is, as most of you have gotten, um, is false. In many ca cases, a trafficker is a caregiver, a friend, or a family member. Um, and I see that someone has asked um, to learn more about why somebody who knows the person, um, why somebody would be a trafficker if they know somebody, um, why they would traffic somebody that they know or they're a caregiver for. Um, and there's there are, are many reasons for this. Um, some people are are exploitative and are taking advantage of somebody. And this is a way that people think that they can get away with this kind of crime um, because they have this power and control that's already built into a situation where there is um, a relationship that's built or a caregiver situation that's built um, or a professional relationship that's already built in. Um, and perhaps even additional items like isolation um, or uh, there are many reasons. Um, sometimes, as we saw with the case of the mom who was trafficking her daughter, um, she was struggling with drug addiction and misuse, and she was doing it because she wanted to um, have more money for purchasing drugs. Um, some people, we, we know that they've exchanged uh, sex acts with someone that they're caring for in exchange for rent. Um, they may have been um, they may have been challenged that they would be kicked out of their home by their landlord, and maybe it's something the landlord brought up that they would be willing to exchange sex acts, for example, um, with the young person in the house, whether it's their child or someone they're caring for in exchange for, for rent. So sometimes it's uh, situations of perceived desperation um, of their situation. Um, the same way that we know that human trafficking or that we consider survival sex um, is considered human trafficking for people who are under the age of 18. Young people are trading sex act for something of basic necessity. Um, we also know that Young people who are transitioning will chain will trade sex acts for things like hormones or money. So we know that hormones are very expensive, and um, this is a way that we know that traffickers are targeting young people who are transitioning as well. Um, okay, next slide. My apologies for the um, technical difficulties earlier, but this is TJ again. And the next uh, statement we would like to uh, bring up is the following. People with disabilities are less likely to report trafficking. If you wanna spend a moment to think about the statement, or if you want to type it true or false in the chat, you may do so. All right, so the answer to the statement is true. People with disabilities may not know how to report, understand the reporting process, or are groomed to mistrust the law enforcement. I will also add that people with disabilities may not know how to report because they may not, um, they may able, they may feel uncomfortable advocating for themselves at first, not taught how to advocate for themselves or others, or they may be um, silenced by um, the traffickers or even family members who are involved. Next slide, please. All right, this is Jesse. So you might, Kind of be wondering since we are talking a lot about these situations and reporting and things like that, maybe why people with disabilities are not reporting human trafficking or when they're experiencing human trafficking. Um, often, first and foremost, is because the process of reporting is not well understood. That's why we're here today to provide some 
some more knowledge about that process. Um, additionally, individuals might fear that they're being fear being accused of being a frequent fire of reporting something that somebody might think is false, be not being believed. Um, they may fear the police and law enforcement in the process of that. It's also a very overwhelming and overstimulating process to go through that. Um, perhaps they can't remember the order of the events that occurred. There may also be communication barriers that make it difficult to, to uh, report the situation. And finally, they may have a fear of losing their independence. So there could be a number of different reasons why people are not reporting. And Jody will talk a little bit more about some of the indicators. Thank you. Um, some of the indicators that you see here um, could include unnecessary or unusual security or accompaniment. Um, you could, we know that um, in some healthcare situations, for example, um, if somebody's there as um, as a chaperone, for example, or maybe they're posing as a translator or truly are somebody who's translating for the or interpreting for the person. Um, if you notice that there is some sort of power and control element there, um, that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, there could be a lack of freedom, so the young person isn't allowed to come and go as they please. Um, there could be signs of assault or restraint or mal malnourishment. Um, they would be paid little or nothing. They work long hours without breaks, for example. Um, they would have isolation from social groups that they may have been a part of in the past. And they might be exhibiting um, new signs of depression or new signs of drug use or misuse. Um, their service animals and mobility devices might be uncared for or broken. Um, frequent emergency room admissions. Um, this can be for a variety of things. Um, as far as um, we know that traffickers are going to want to make sure that the people that they are um, that they're trafficking are going to be healthy enough to continue to provide the services that get getting them money, frankly. So um, they want to make sure that 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 one place that they will take them is to um, the emergency room to make sure that they're um, going to be um, healthy enough to do the work that the traffickers are trying to make them do. Um, and also there are physical injuries that have been left untreated. So these might be um, smaller things that are probably um, signs of abuse from the trafficker. And we know that not all of these are indicators specifically of trafficking, but they can be something that would make you want to think further about if this could possibly be not only abuse, but a, an issue of trafficking as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, some questions that you can ask, and we do want you all to know, first of all, that we're going to explore in the next to um, webinars, ways that you can respond to trafficking, um, where you can have confidence in responding to a trafficking situation, ways that you can really look out and identify what trafficking is and feel confident in that and know which next steps to take. Um, but today we do wanna leave you with a couple of just items that you can take with you and start thinking about before next week's webinar. So some of those questions you can ask is, can you leave your job if you want to? Um, can you come and go if you please? Are you hurting? Do you have access to your medication? Um, where do you sleep? Where do you eat? Do you know where your ID is? Um, why is your mobility aid broken? Um, these are all questions that you can get the essence of and ask in the way that you know is appropriate for the person that you're working with um, to get the answers that might lead to some sort of exploitation, abuse, or even human trafficking. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah. So, you know, in the end, if you are suspective of human trafficking or that it's occurring, ultimately you do want to report it if you do suspect that. Um, obviously, safety for you and the person that you're serving or working with is the first priority. Um, it may also be helpful to explain mandated reporting to that in individual. 
uh, interpreters and supports should be ready before you need them. So if the individual does need some sort of translator or interpreter, be sure to provide that. Um, it's also important to provide choice and autonomy throughout the process and to use trauma informed language and take your time as you're going through through that process. And again, like Jody mentioned, that is something that we'll go in depth on um, the next 2 webinars. Um, also, know who to call within your community. Um, we'll kind of end with a few other referral or. Uh, support options that, that we'll go through, but, you know, maybe look up different domestic violence services, your local police department, Q LBGBTQIA plus organizations, pride centers, sexual assault organizations, crime victim services, human trafficking task force um, in your state or in your city. Um, and of course, the human trafficking line, which Jody can talk a little bit more about. Um, I did mention that there is a, a hotline dedicated specifically to human trafficking. This is a national human trafficking hotline, and I know that there are people on this webinar from all over the place. Um, but I would also suggest that you look for local hotlines as well. Local hotlines for human trafficking will have um, a, a greater understanding of the comprehensive services that are, that are available to young people who have experienced human trafficking. Um, so they'll be able to give you a more robust under, or, um, referral. Um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline can be, can be used for greater referrals. Um, you can call confidenti confidentially. And if you also just want some resources, you can also call or the Human Trafficking Hotline or the, um, the National Resource Center there as well. Next slide. Um, we've included some resources here that we would love for you to look at um, in your own time. Again, we'll be covering a lot of this information in the next in the next webinar um, when we really get into how to respond to human trafficking. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we do want to provide some information for you. Um, this is IOFA's information and also the National Human Trafficking and Disability Group information. And as I mentioned before, for those of you who are in Chicago, we would love to um, have you a part of the Chicago group as well. Uh, next slide. Um, great. And here's an overview of what we'll be doing next week. Same time. And the next slide. And. Uh, this is it. We would love to um, thank all of you for attending today, and we hope to see you all again next week. And I do want you all to remember, uh, as a reminder, we'll be sending out the post survey that'll be coming in just the next couple of days. And I do want to um, thank TJ and Jesse and um, everyone who has been able to uh, provide our platform today and our captioning. Uh, Jesse. Yeah, thank you all so much. And I know a few people asked if we can share the slides or the resources. I think we can definitely do that. Um, and yes, any questions that anyone has, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I can pull up the email one more time. Um, I know we also provided an email and a website on the bottom of the assessment that you will receive. So look out for that as well. And yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you.